So I'm Phoebe, and I'm a research oceanographer with NOAA's Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center. And I apologize, I'm getting over a cold, so if you can't hear me, just let me know and I'll try and speak up a little louder. Hopefully my voice keeps up for the whole time. Um, so most of my work focuses on the pelagic ecosystem in the Central North Pacific. And I look at how stressors such as the fishery and climate change have impacted the ecosystem and are projected to impact the ecosystem over the coming century. So just to give you an idea of what we'll go over today, um, I'll just define the area that we're going to look at with this talk. And then I'll step through the food web. And we'll break the food web into three basic components, sort of the base of the food web, the mid-trophic levels, and then the apex predators. And then from there, we'll go into looking at the fishery, just a general overview, and then how the catch has changed in the last few decades. And then finally, we'll conclude with looking at how some human influences are impacting the pelagic ecosystem from fishing to marine change. So what we're looking at here is satellite remotely sensed chlorophyll concentration. So that's the green pigment and phytoplankton, which are like the green plants in the ocean. And so what you can see here in the middle of the North Pacific, there's these dark blue and black colors where chlorophyll is really, really low. So we call this an oligotrophic gyre, and oligotrophic means just low productivity. So that's the um, North Pacific subtropical gyre, and this area is really the focus of what I'll be talking about today. So that's the area we're going to focus on. And you can see that each major ocean basin has a similar oligotrophic gyre, so there's similar processes happening throughout the ocean basins. So the pelagic food web. So this is a schematic diagram of the pelagic food web in the central North Pacific. And it definitely does not include all of the components of the food web. This really focuses on the components that are most directly associated with the Hawaii-based longline fishery. But what we're looking at is each circle represents relative biomass, so how much stuff there is in that group relative to the other groups. And then the arrows between the circles show energy pathways, or basically predator-prey linkages between the circles. And the thick lines with the warm colors means there's more energy passing between those groups. And the thin lines with the cooler colors mean there's less energy or less predation linkages across those groups. And then when we look <clears throat> at the food web, we usually define the food web looking at trophic levels. And a trophic level is just um, a predation link in the food web. So if you look here at trophic level one, that's the very bottom of the food web. That's the base of the food web. That's where your phytoplankton are. They capture the sun's energy through photosynthesis, just like green plants on land. And they make that energy available to consumers at all the other trophic levels. So if we go up one trophic linkage to trophic level two, so trophic level two there, those are things that are eating the phytoplankton. So that's one step up on the ladder. And you can go up through the trophic levels that way. So this food web in the Central North Pacific has about five trophic levels in it. So when I talk about it today, I'm going to break it into the base of the food web, or trophic level one, here at the bottom. And then I'm going to sort of group the mid-trophic levels together. So we'll look at trophic levels two, three, and four as mid-trophic levels. And then at the top, trophic level five, we'll look at as apex predators. So we'll talk about some of the organisms that make up each of these trophic levels and some of the methods that researchers use to look at the, these organisms and study them. So the base of the food web, we said these are our green plants. This is where photosynthesis occurs. This captures all the energy to make it available to other um, consumers. And what we're looking at here are plots of the average size of phytoplankton in the North Pacific in the wintertime and in the summertime. So you can see in the central North Pacific, we have these dark blue and green colors. And those are smaller phytoplankton. So if you think of phytoplankton as sort of a sphere and the diameter across, that sphere is what we use to define how big phytoplankton are. So in the central North Pacific, phytoplankton are about one micrometer in diameter. And if you want to put that in comparison with our macroscopic world that we look at or live in, one micrometer is about one one hundredth the thickness of a sheet of paper or about one fiftieth the thickness of a human hair. So they're really, really small phytoplankton compared to other areas like coastal upwelling areas. And the reason that phytoplankton in the central North Pacific are so small is because we have very low nutrient concentrations at the surface of the ocean here compared to other areas. And if a cell is really small, 
the surface area is greater relative to its volume than if it were a lot bigger. So it's more efficient at absorbing nutrients that it needs to grow. So that's why the phytoplankton are so small. They can maximize their ability to take up nutrients. So if we think about how different, how easy it is to study different levels of the food web, phytoplankton are pretty easy to study compared to other components in the food web. So phytoplankton need light to grow, right? And all the sunlight at the ocean is close to the surface. If you look at how light declines through the ocean, it attenuates exponentially with depth. So the brightest sunlight is at the surface of the ocean, and that's where the phytoplankton are. So this means that we can study phytoplankton through things like satellite remotely sensed data. So we can use satellites and get a great picture of the whole surface of the Earth. So that's great. Also, if we're doing shipboard surveys, say we take a research vessel out, it's a lot easier to sample the surface of the ocean than things that are way down on the seafloor. So it's pretty easy to sample. And then finally, you can grow phytoplankton in the lab to some degree. You can collect water at sea and you can incubate those phytoplankton. You can see how they respond to different temperatures or light levels or nutrients or competition among different species. And that's a lot harder to do with other components of the food web. So if we go up a notch on our trophic food web ladder there, now we're getting into the lower mid trophic levels. Here's some pictures or examples from trawl studies. So most of these lower mid trophic level organisms are things like small fish and gelatinous organisms. And the examples that you're seeing here are collected from trawl studies. So basically we take a net and we tow it behind a research ship. These were caught at about 200 meters depth and a little bit shallower. So you can see there's a lot of fish that have been far on the left there is um, mctophids. They're usually mostly black, but they don't fare too well in the trawl, so a lot of their scales have come off, so that's why they look pink. You can also see up here, um, there's a bunch of shrimp and crustaceans. We also have a bunch of larval fish there down on the lower right-hand side. And then in the middle is a bunch of gelatinous organisms. There's things like salps and jellyfish, things like that. So compared to other trophic levels, the lower mid trophic levels are very, very hard to sample. And there's a number of reasons why they're challenging to sample. First, these organisms are small. Those rulers that are in each of the pictures are six inches long. So these things are really small and it's harder to catch small things. Also, a lot of them are gelatinous. And so gelatinous things, if you take a net and pull it through the water, they pass through the net, they get all beat up in the net, they're really fragile. So it's hard to collect them and bring them back and study them. Also things like small squids and little octopods are really good at swimming away from nets. They're not very easy to catch with trawling. Um, on top of that, so we said phytoplankton are usually up at the surface of the ocean, they need sunlight, they have to be up there. Once we start getting a little bit higher in the food web, these organisms in their daily migrations, they cover a huge depth range. And I'll show some examples in following slides, but they're not all up at the surface. They span a really large depth range of hundreds and thousands of meters. So that's an added challenge to sampling them. On top of that, <clears throat> they're very abundant and very diverse. There's lots of these organisms and there's a lot of different kinds of organisms. So if you're gonna get a good idea of what's out there, you need to sample a lot of different things and over time and over space. And then finally, organisms this low down in the food web don't have any commercial value. So there's no fishermen that are going out and catching these. There's no recreational fishermen catching them. There's just scientists that are out there sampling the environment. And scientists cannot get out there the way that fishermen can get out there in the numbers and the time and the area. So we're really limited in our ability to sample these organisms. So I mentioned um, they're hard to study from trawling for a number of reasons. So we can use other methods to study the lower mid trophic levels. And one method that researchers use is looking at stomach content data from things that eat these lower mid trophic level organisms. So these are things like tunas and billfishes and we can get their stomachs back from longline fishermen and the observer program. And we can look at what's in their stomach and get an idea of what are in these lower mid trophic levels. So there's some results from some colleagues of mine and a couple of things that make stomach content data work challenging is it's skilled work and it's time consuming work. And as you can see from the example there, what's in a fish stomach does not look like what's out in the ocean. So it takes some work to figure out from what's in the stomach, what was, what was actually eaten. 
So that's an example of a big eye tuna stomach content there. And from that mush, they found some crustaceans, some hard parts from fishes, and then some larval fish as well. So I mentioned that there's a lot of different organisms in the lower mid-trophic levels. And what we're looking at in this plot here on the x-axis is the number of stomachs that were sampled. And each line there is a different species of predator. And on the vertical y-axis, we're looking at the number of different prey categories. So if you had sampled every kind of prey that a predator is eating, you would see a flat horizontal line. So you could sample more and more stomachs, but you're not going to find anything new because you've sampled everything they've eaten. But what you can see there is even when the, for species where they've sampled upwards of 100 stomachs, the line is still going upwards. So when they're doing more stomachs, they're finding more and more different organisms in there. So it's just sort of to give you an illustration of how diverse the lower mid-tropic levels are in the food web. So another method that we can use to study the lower mid-trophic levels is acoustic sampling. And this basically works, we take a research vessel, we go out, we, ping, we send down pings of sound from the, an echo sounder on the ship. And then when it encounters an organism, it's returned back to the ship. So the time that it takes for the sound to leave the ship and return can tell us how deep organisms are. And the strength of the sound when it comes back relative to when it left can give us some idea of the size and the composition of the organism. So what we're looking at here is about 24 hours of acoustic data, starting and ending around noon. And the warmer yellow and red colors are where there's a lot of biomass. So there's a lot of small organisms sending sound back up to the ship. And then the cooler blue colors are where there's less biomass. So there's a couple of things we can see here. If we start at noon, there's a thick layer of organisms between about five and 600 meters. And there's a little bit, there's some layers a little further up in the water column, but a lot of that biomass is down a little deeper in the water column. And then around sunset, there's this big migration up towards the surface. Then overnight, most of the organisms are up close to the surface. Not all of them, but quite a lot of the organisms have come up closer to the surface. And then around sunrise, we see the opposite. The organisms start descending down in the water column and moving back down to about five or 600 meters. So this happens every day all around the oceans. It's called diel vertical migration. It is the largest migration of animals and biomass on the planet. And the reason that really small uh, marine organisms do this is to evade their predators. So if you think of where the light is in the ocean during the daytime, it's really bright at the surface. So if you're a predator, like a tuna or a billfish, it's easier to see the things that you're trying to eat. So the prey items go down deeper during the day. It's a lot darker down at five or 600 meters. They can kind of hide under the cover of darkness. At nighttime, it's dark up at the surface. So the organisms come up to the surface. That's where the phytoplankton are. There's small zooplankton, things like that. There's just more food up there close to the surface. So when it's dark at night, they come up and eat. And then as it starts to get light out, they descend back down to try and evade their predators. Now the predators are doing the same thing, but this happens every day in the ocean. And then if we step up just a little bit higher in the food web, we get to our upper mid trophic level organisms. And this is where we start getting into things we're a little more familiar with, things like mahi-mahi and then some other fish like lancet fish, escalar. So we refer to these upper mid-trophic levels as mesopredators, and their numbers and their abundance is controlled by apex predators, either because apex predators are eating them directly, or mesopredators and apex predators are competing for the same food, and the apex predators can outcompete them and keep their numbers down that way. And then finally, <clears throat> we can get up to the top of our food web, we get up to the apex predators, these are fishes I think we're more familiar with. We think of things that we like to eat, like tunas and billfishes. It also includes sharks and tooth cetaceans. I just put some examples up there for you. So these apex predators have advantages and disadvantages when it comes to studying them. Um, in terms of advantages, a lot of these apex predators are commercially valuable. So that means that fishermen, commercial fishermen, and recreational fishermen are out there in large numbers catching them and we can get samples back from the fishermen and we can get a good idea of what's out there, how many different types of fish there are and how their numbers are changing over time. 
Also, because these apex predators are really large animals, we can put tags on them. And I'll show you some examples of what we can learn from tags. But you can't put a tag on a really small organism. The tag is bigger than them, and it just doesn't work. So on the downside to studying apex predators, they have really huge habitats. In addition to for, um, migrating vertically every day in the water column, they span tens of hundreds and thousands of kilometers over the course of the year in their lifetime. So they're covering a huge area over time. And then also a number of these species are really long lived. They can live for several decades or in the case of some cetaceans up to a century. So to try and study their full lifespan, it, you have to pay attention to them for a long time as opposed to something like phytoplankton that has a lifespan of maybe a day. So just a challenge to studying them. So I mentioned tagging data, and I'll show you a few examples from tagging data. Um, the example that's shown here is a pop-up archival tag, and it measures depth via pressure. It measures temperature, and then it also measures light level, which can give us latitude and longitude. There's other kinds of tags that scientists deploy that will give you actual latitude and longitude, um, but that, those are not the ones I'm going to show today. So these tags were deployed in partnership with a commercial fishery. So the big vessel in the foreground there is a commercial fishing vessel, and we in the background, you can see our research ship back there. And then there's just an example of the tag being placed on a fish on there, so you can get an idea of how big the tags are relative to some of these fish. So the first example is from a swordfish. This is 11 days of tagging data, and we're looking at its depth over time. So you can see that it spends some time up at the surface, it spends some time around 600 meters, and then it spends time really deep in the water column down to about 1,000 meters. And if we focus in on a single day, it starts and ends at midnight. We can see that at night, the swordfish are up near the surface, during the day, they're going deeper in the water column from about 500 to 1,000 meters. And then at night, they're spending more time back up at the surface again. So if we think back to that acoustic echogram that I showed and where the prey for these apex predators are, they're basically following their prey through the water column. And then another thing that I think is really interesting, this is the same 11 days <coughs> that I showed earlier. And each of the dark gray bars there is nighttime. So I mentioned that this is cued by light level. It's lighter during the day, darker at night. And then that red line is showing us moon illumination. So at the beginning of the time period, it's the full moon. So it's really bright out at night. And towards the end of the time span, we're approaching a new moon. So it's much darker at night. And if you look at the depth of where the swordfish is over time at night, when it's really bright out at night, they're a little bit deeper at night. And then as it starts being darker at night, they're spending more time up really close to the surface. So that just gives you an example of how finely tuned these predators and other organisms are to their environment and how quickly they're reacting to the uh, facets of their habitat. So another predator that we can look at is big-eyed tuna. This is about three weeks of tag data from a tuna. So we can see that similar to the swordfish, it's spending time up near the surface and then it's spending time down at depth not as deep as the swordfish, it's only going down to about 500 meters, but it still has that variation in where it's spending time. And if we zoom in and look at a single day, again, starting and ending at midnight, we can see that, again, at nighttime, they're up near the surface. During the daytime, they're deeper in the water. And then once it's nighttime again, they're back up to the surface. So one thing that's a little different from the tuna to the swordfish is that you can see during the day, they make several excursions back up towards the surface that we didn't really see in the swordfish tags. They were spending more time on a depth. And so there's a couple reasons why different predators have to come back up to different depths during the day. And partly, fish need oxygen to breathe. They need oxygen to move just like we do. There's more oxygen up at the surface. So that can be one difference between species, why some have to come up shallower than others. Also, the deeper you go, the colder the water gets. And the warmer your muscles are, a fish, just like an athlete, athletes warm up before they're going to do something athletic. You can swim faster, you can chase down prey faster, and you can avoid your predators faster if your muscles are warm. And different species have different tolerances for this. 
So it could be that the tunas are coming up to warm back up for a little bit so they can be more efficient down in depth. <coughs> and then the last example is from opa or moonfish. So this is just a number of tags over time pulled together. The open bars are for daytime and the closed bars are for nighttime. And again, the same pattern a little deeper during the day and up close to the surface at night. So we can put all this together and what we're looking at is the time that different predators spend during the daytime and the nighttime at different depths and each color is a different species. But rather than focusing on what each species is doing, what I really want to point out is that if you look over the daytime, each species is maximizing its time at a different depth. So they're really focusing on a specific prey and a specific habitat and that's sort of their niche when it comes to what they're foraging for and where they're getting their food. And then at the nighttime, we see a similar thing. It's, not, it's more compressed towards the surface, but again, each different species is really spending time at specific depths. So we don't have a lot of overlap. So continuing with apex predators, we can move into looking at the fishery. So just some brief overview of Hawaii's longline fishery. It began in the early 1900s using vessels and methods imported from Japan. It expanded rapidly at the end of the 1980s. And then in the early 1990s, it was regulated by federal regulations that capped the number of permits that can be issued to fishermen. And there's three types of fishing from the Hawaii fishery. There's tuna fishing, swordfish fishing, and then mixed sets that fish for tuna and swordfish. So this blue box here in the Pacific shows um, the bulk of the fishing grounds for the Hawaii-based fishery. The tuna fishery operates across almost that entire box throughout the year. It covers a really huge area. The swordfish fishery is focused more along the northern boundary of that box and more in the wintertime. And the mixed sets are sort of a mix between the two. If we look at what the fishery is bringing in, we can see that predominantly the biggest fishery is the big eye tuna fishery compared to the swordfish fishery. They catch a lot more fish and they operate over a much greater time of the year. But they catch other things just besides just big eye tuna and swordfish. Um, most of the shark catch is thrown back. Um, it's not commercially valuable. But they also catch a number of other species like mahi-mahi or the opa or palm frits. And those aren't their target species, but they're commercially valuable. They can sell them at the auction, so they will bring those back. You can see in the case of at least mahi-mahi, they catch quite a few of them. And then we can look at how the Hawaii-based fishery in Honolulu <coughs> compares with other commercial fishing ports in the United States. So if we look in terms of volume, so how many pounds of fish are coming into Honolulu compared to other commercial fishing ports, we're not too high up in the list. Other places in Alaska and Massachusetts are much higher in terms of poundage. Um, that's because if you think of what our fisheries are catching, it's those apex predators at the top of the food web, and there's just less biomass at the top, and other fisheries are fishing um, lower in the food web, and there's a lot more biomass. And there are also some fisheries that are bigger too. However, when you look in terms of the value of the fish that come to the Honolulu port, um, we're fifth in the nation. So it's a very valuable fishery. So even though we're not bringing as many pounds of fish in as other fisheries, we're, it's very valuable. And that's just because, again, we're catching those apex predators that are really valuable fish. So in addition to the fishermen going out there and catching fish, they also provide records that are helpful to scientists as well when we're trying to study the ecosystem. So I mentioned that commercial fishermen can get out there in much greater numbers and over a much greater portion of the year than scientists can. So this is very helpful to people like me that are studying the ecosystem. And we get two types of data back from the fishery. We get logbook records. All the vessel masters are required by law to keep these logbooks. They record every hook that goes in the water, where it goes in the water, when it goes in the water, when it comes out of the water, and everything they catch. When it terms, comes to looking what they catch, they mostly record commercially valuable species. Over time, they've been adding more species into their logbooks, but it's really focused on commercial species. So it gives us a good idea of every fishing vessel that's out there, but not a full picture of everything they're catching. And then on the other hand, we have observer records. So there are federal observers on a portion of the fishing vessels. 
The swordfish fishery sets their hooks very shallow when they fish at night, and 100% of these vessels have federal observers on them. Um, in the past, there's been interactions with this fishery and turtles, and when they catch a certain number of turtles, they close the fishery. So that's why there's 100% observer coverage for the swordfish fishery. And then the big eye tuna, the deep set fishery, they set their hooks a lot deeper in the water and they set them during the day. And about 20% of these vessels have federal observers on board. So the advantage of the observer records, even though they're not out there and is great in number, is they're recording everything the vessel masters record as well as every single thing that's caught, whether it's commercially valuable or not, whether they keep it or throw it back, they record everything. And then on top of that, they also measure the length of a subset of the catch. So since 2006, they've been measuring the length of every third fish that comes on deck. So that can give us an idea of the size of the fish, because we can take that length and convert it into a weight and get a good sense of how big different species are and if that's changing over time. So the records that I look at are primarily from the deep set fishery. It's much, it's predominantly the bigger fishery. So on the left is a schematic diagram. Each little circle would be a hook. So as a fisherman set out line behind their boat, there's all these sections of hooks. And in between them are floats that bring those peaks up towards the surface. So you get these catenaries of hooks behind the ship for miles. And then the plot there on the right is just the depth of different hooks along that catenary. So the hooks are spanning about 50 to 350 meters in the water column. And if you think back to that tagging data that showed where those predators are during the daytime, that really covers the full span of where those species are, which makes sense because that's what the fishery is trying to catch. So they're really targeting those hooks. They'll put them out in the morning, leave them out all day, and then recover them out at night. So we can learn quite a bit about the fishery from these records. The first thing in the colored lines, we can get a sense of just the different groups of fish that the fishery is catching and how it's changing over time. Um, this is, you can see primarily they catch tunas, which makes sense, there's the tuna fishery. But they're also catching almost equal numbers of other commercial and non-commercial fish. These are things for the commercial fish, as I mentioned, mahi-mahi, opa, palm frits, things like that. For the non-commercial fish, it's fish like lancet fish and snake mackerel. And some of the walu, they can sell some of them. And then in lower numbers, we have sharks. Most of the sharks are thrown back. Only a small portion of the blue shark catch is sold commercially, as well as billfishes and then um, pelagic stingrays. And then another thing we can look at is the size of the catch. So the bar plot shows um, all those fish links all pooled together for a number of years. We can get a sense of how the catch, how big the fish are that the fishermen are catching. So we can see most of the catch is a little bit smaller. And if the fishery were equally efficient at catching all the fish that were out there, this line as you got towards zero would go up to a peak. It would be an exponential curve. Because as you get to the top of the food web, there's just less and less biomass. But if you look towards the smaller sizes, fish less than about 15 kilograms, it doesn't follow that nice smooth curve up towards a higher number. And that's because the fishery is just not as efficient as catching those smaller fishes. They're not as valuable. They're not what the fishery is trying to catch. So their gear is not designed to catch them. So that's why it doesn't follow exactly what you'd expect to see. But still, we can get a sense of the sizes of the fish, and then we can look at how that changes over time. So what we've seen in about the last two decades is that a number of these apex predators, these large organisms, their catch has been declining over time from anywhere to about 2 to 7% per year since 1996. And at the same time that the catch of these large apex predators has been declining, the catch of these mesopredators that I mentioned earlier has been increasing anywhere from about 2 to 15% per year. So we're really seeing this shift in what the fishermen are catching. And we can put these together we're looking at in the top left is again just the catch of those smaller fish, 1 to 15 kilograms, and on the bottom is the large fish. And we can put that together in the total percentage of the catch that's greater than 15 kilograms, those apex predators, has declined from about 70% to about 40 or 45% since 1996. And at the same time that that has been declining, 
the discard rate in the fishery or the rate of fish that they throw back because they're not commercially valuable has been increasing from about 30% up to about 45%. And so things that are discarded are things like lancet fish, snake mackerels, pelagic stingrays, and then most of the shark catch. <laughs> so looking at why we're seeing this change in the fishery sort of takes us into our human influences on the ecosystem. So we can look at the number of hooks that the fishermen put out, and we can see that it's increased nearly threefold over the last couple decades. And when we look, we can model how the catch would change based on this hook, this deployment of hooks. And we can see that we think that the fishery is changing based on the fishing effort. So what you're looking at here is along the x-axis is the size of fish. They're really small fish all the way on the left and bigger fish on the right. And as you move from blue through green to black, that's fishing level increasing relative to no fishing. And those two circles, the first circle is the size where fish are first starting to be caught by the fishery. And the second one is where the fishery is really efficient at catching them and it's sampling them evenly across what's there. So what we see is as we increase fishing mortality, we drive down these numbers of large predators, their competitors and prey are able to increase and then that attenuates as you get further down in the food web because they're not interacting directly with the food web. So we think this change in the catch has really been driven a lot by fishing effort in the fishery. So other human influences that we can look at uh, are marine debris. So I mentioned that some colleagues that were looking at stomach content data for apex predators, and they were seeing a lot of marine debris in these fish stomachs. So that's things like plastic, as well as rope, twine, metal wire, stuff like that. So they started looking in more detail at the marine debris they were seeing. And the pictures there on the left are some examples. Each of those little scale bars is one centimeter for comparison. And they saw that what about 20% of the stomachs that they were looking at had marine debris in them, and they vary greatly by species. So things like snake mackerel had very little marine debris, whereas almost 60% of the opa had marine debris in their stomach. And these pie charts, each column is a different species, and it's just all the stomachs for that species pooled together. The top row is percentage by number, so number of things they took out of the stomach, and the bottom row is by weight, so if you weighed everything that was in the stomach. And the black wedges are marine debris, and all the colors are biological prey items or things you'd expect them to be eating. So you can see it varies by species, and in some of them it can make up a large component of what is found in their stomachs. So one particularly troubling thing about these predators eating marine debris is if you look especially at some of those bigger pieces of plastic there, fish just cannot pass that through their digestive system. So the more plastic they eat over time, some of these are really long-lived fish, right? So they're always eating. And that plastic can accumulate in their stomach. And the volume that's occupied by plastic, that can't be occupied by nutritionally beneficial food. So over time, it has the potential to have a negative impact on these apex predators is it makes them less able to um, eat food that they need to swim and grow and reproduce. So looking at the degree that that affects apex predators is something that's going to take more work, but at least it's out there on the radar now. And then finally, the last human influence on the pelagic ecosystem is um, climate change. When I think of the impacts of climate change on the pelagic ecosystem, I think of really three things. And the first has to do with ocean warming and habitat. The next has to do with ocean warming and phytoplankton. And then the third has to do with ocean acidification. So what we're looking at is projected temperatures for the beginning and end of the 21st century. And what you can see is by the end of the century, those cooler waters further north are getting shifted even further north. And here just south of Hawaii, that we're seeing this whole new area of warm sea surface temperatures that we just haven't seen before. So this is a whole new habitat. We don't know how fish will be able to cope with this because it doesn't exist right now. So if you think about how you feel on a hot day, I mean, to a point we like it to be warm, but above a certain point, it, it's not helpful to you. It's actually detrimental that it's warm. You don't feel as good. You can't swim, like move around as fast. You're just not as fit when it's warmer. So at some point, fish have that same threshold. And so we'll have to see where that threshold is as this new habitat emerges. And then another piece of warming and habitat is oxygen. So as you heat seawater, it holds less oxygen. And fish need oxygen to breathe, basically. 
So what we're looking at here is everywhere that you see a brown color is where oxygen concentration is projected to decline over the century, and the blue colors are where it's projected to increase. So most of the central North Pacific is projected to see lower oxygen concentrations. So that's just another stressor on these top predators that impacts their ability to metabolize food and grow and reproduce. The second aspect of climate change and ocean warming has to do with phytoplankton. So this is work that looks at the percent decline in small and large phytoplankton over this 21st century. And almost everywhere in the North Pacific, phytoplankton is projected to decline as the ocean warms. And the reason for this is, as you warm up the surface, so we already have low nutrient concentrations at the surface here. And the way those nutrients get to the surface is through mixing from deeper waters, just through natural things like wind and waves and things like that. As you heat up the surface, physically it's more difficult to get those nutrients to mix up towards the surface. So as the ocean warms, there's projected to be less nutrients up at the surface, which means less phytoplankton. And as we said, phytoplankton are the base of the food web. They provide the energy that's available to all consumers at all higher trophic levels. So that means that if there's less phytoplankton, there's less food for everything. So we can look at how that's projected to impact large fish. And we can see that depending on the method that you're using, the number of fish, the biomass of large fish is projected to decline over the 21st century just because there's less food for them to eat. And then the final piece is ocean acidification. So the reason we have ocean warming is because we're increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is the atmosphere. But some of that carbon dioxide is also absorbed by the ocean. And as, you'd, as the ocean absorbs more carbon dioxide, it becomes more acidic. So everywhere that you see a brown color on that plot is where it's projected to become more acidic. And I think a lot of people, I know when I think of ocean acidification, I primarily think of coral reefs. And you think of ocean acidification dissolving the calcium carbonate, and it's, we really think of it as a reef type thing. But there's organisms in the pelagic realm that calcify as well. They grow little shells. Or if you think of squids, they have hard parts in their suckers as well. So increasing ocean waters in the pelagic realm can impact these organisms as well. To show you an example, uh, I think a lot of oceanographers thought that this, they wouldn't start seeing impacts of this in the pelagic until towards the end of the century. But they did some work. They were looking at pteropods. And these are little. Um, Zooplankton, they have hard shells. They're about this big, if you were to look at them, not under a microscope. They're small, like the size of an M&M, &M maybe. And what they were seeing is that they're already seeing impacts of ocean acidification on their shells, and they're having a harder time being able to calcify these shells. And so this just makes these organisms weaker, makes them easier prey, and harder for them to grow and increase their numbers. So that's just another impact toward the lower end of the food web is an impact of climate change. So just wrapping everything up together, the pelagic food web in the central North Pacific consists of about five trophic levels. There's very diverse components across these trophic levels and a lot of different energy pathways between them. We've seen that the top predators are using a large extent of the water column down to at least 1,000 meters throughout the day chasing their prey. Looking at human impacts on the ecosystem, we've seen that the fishery has exerted what we call a top-down change by changing that balance of apex predators and mesopredators. And then as we look at the impacts from climate change, we expect them to lower the amount of phytoplankton and biomass that the fishery as a whole can support. So when we picture the Central North Pacific ecosystem towards the end of the century, we expect it'll have fewer large and more small organisms. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. No? I saw recently in an article that um, zooplankton are believed to be eating plastics too. Is that the microplastics that I, people are talking about? I would imagine it has to be. That's the only thing that would is be the right size. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. And that's another field that people are starting to really look at. A big mm -hmm. challenge in that is microplastics are so small and yeah. it's just hard to sample them but it's getting more attention now. Does an increase in carbon dioxide have a, have a 
effect on the population of the phytoplankton though? I mean, is there a correlation between more carbon dioxide and more types of phytoplankton or something? Or does it increase the depth of it or is it what does anything happen to that? Not that I know of. I'm not sure. That would be something interesting to look at, but no, I don't know. There are some phytoplankton that do calcify mm -hmm. and have shells. They're more in colder waters, but I would expect it to have a negative impact on those organisms. But beyond that, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not, not a scientific fish person, but I'm a <laughs> <laughs> But here in Hawaii, we hear a lot about the um, soup that occurs from the plastics and everything. Would that, and is that universally spread throughout, or is it concentrated areas? And would that be impacting then the temperatures, the acidity, and everything in parts of the ocean, where it's not impacting it on other parts of the ocean? There are parts of the ocean that have a greater concentration of marine debris just based on ocean circulations. There's places where um, things aggregate, and places where they're, um, they move apart. So in the center of the gyre, like if you think of the, the very first slide where there's the black areas, that's where you'd expect to see higher concentrations. In terms of how that would increase temperatures, I'm not sure, but that would be interesting to look at. Are you thinking it would absorb more heat or concentrate? Well, I don't know, but I just think because of the dispersion of the temperatures and acidity and everything else, I just am looking for other factors contributing to that. Yeah, that would be interesting to look. Yeah. For, for the marine people. <laughs> <laughs>